This podcast is brought to you in association with From Sweden with Love, one of the oldest fan sites dedicated to the world of 007. Online since 2004 and also on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Why not check them out today? James Bond, 007.se Nobody does it better. (laughs) <laughs> or as they say in Stockholm these days, Ingen gör det bättre. Every film Every stunt. Every story. Ever heard of Evil Can Evil? Welcome. To the YouTube series. I'm John Orty. I'm a stunt historian, author, broadcaster and producer and I'm the man behind behind the stunts on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Welcome to this series of YouTube shorts dedicated to the action and stunts in the James Bond films. My new book, Ever Heard of Evil Knievel, is the definitive guide to everything action-packed in the film franchise. The coordinators, the stories behind these incredible moments, all captured on film. We'll talk through some of those great stunt sequences, and a few you may have missed along the way. So buckle up, you could be in for a bumpy ride. The book, podcast and YouTube series are also to be used as educational tools to learn from and to wonder at. This week we are once again in 1967, only this time in a volcano just outside Slough, as it happens, and in outer space, for you only live twice. James Bond is of course getting bigger and better, and uh, Bob Simmons is being given many more responsibilities because the audience wants to see something they haven't seen before. We are also joined this week by two stuntmen who will give us the bird's eye view of what it was like to be on the set on this film. That's Rocky Taylor and Vic Armstrong. But we start in the office of Mr. Osato. So, this is the fight. Uh, Peter Mavia is the opponent, of course, The Rock's grandfather, and uh, Connery doubled by Bob Simmons. There's the Japanese somersault, as we uh, always expect from these pictures now, uh, almost expecting to see it in every time. Throws him out through the petition, over the sofa, ooh, just clips the top of the table. And uh, it's a lovely set, but it is a very hard floor, but Bob was very concerned about the floor. Bang! Hits him with this. Look at the, the... He's very agile for a big man, obviously a wrestler, but I mean really agile, and that's a hard floor to land on. Um, I can't remember the last time somebody threw a sofa at me, but I imagine it wouldn't be terribly pleasant. Here's the sword routine, flicked over the top at huge speed. Um, I've slowed it down here to just have a look. Is there something behind that chair there on the floor? Maybe just something to say, can I have a little bit of padding there? Just something... Maybe it's not very clear, but that's possibly where that uh, why that chair is there. Um, and now the sword comes out, throwing it at him, and him dodging out of the way. This next move is interesting because uh, it involves the sword, it involves balance, it particularly involves throwing over Bob's shoulder. He comes in, watch the left ankle of Bob Simmons. Bend. Oh, that's unpleasant. Let's have another look at it. He's got to get rid of that sword as well before he goes over his back. Under, throws him. That's a lot of weight on Bob's uh, ankle. Very unpleasant. I imagine that would have been quite uh, uh, pretty discomfort. And then to get rid of him, bosh, have that. There we go. Jobs are good. Don't forget to put everything back where you found it. Well done, Sean. 
And now let's have a chat with Rocky and Vic about their time on the set. And Bob Simmons is the coordinator and George Leach was his, his partner on it. And I met both of them and I was just awestruck, you know, going to the Pinewood Studios, which was the first studio I'd ever worked at anyway. Mm. And I saw this massive, great building all covered in, in canvas, scaffolding building. It was bigger than St. Paul's Cathedral, right. and which is on the back lot where the 007 <laughs> stage is now. Right. And I went in there and met them and everything else. And it was huge. It was just this great amphitheater inside. And uh, they said, oh, we're, we're looking for, for stuntmen to slide down a rope from the top of the roof there. And it's like 125 feet. Uh, do you think you could do it? I said, oh, yeah, of course I can, you know, no problem. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, that will never happen. Yeah, and I, I got the job anyway and went along there. And in those days, I was, I was very fit and I was a, a jockey. And so my power to weight ratio is very good. And so mm. it worked out that I was great sliding down the ropes. You know, you have to handle your own weight sliding down. And they had this system rigged at, uh, where you have an inch, just over an inch diameter rope. Okay. And you have a piece of hose pipe split and you put around it and you use that as a, as a brake shoe. So right. you're basically holding and using your own weight. So I did that. And then I got advanced even more upwards. And I became one of the guys that came down one handed using a, a device to decelerate us. And so you could come down one handed firing a machine gun. Got it. Okay. And uh, so I was now up with a hierarchy, but the whole thing about you only live twice for me was the fact that it was just, uh, networking with all these stuntmen because every stuntman in england that was not working and there were very few not working yes exactly yeah uh there were very, a lot not working i should say and um so i met all these stuntmen from joe powell to everybody all the way down the line you know so it, it's still been good stead along the years afterwards as well I mean, and uh, the, I the, an awful lot. And, the other thing to bear in mind on my understanding of it is that the um register as we understand it or the group of stunt professionals that were working there there weren't actually that many and they needed many more didn't they so they would presumably have to bring people in from from other physical work, walks of life right oh yeah there was probably 20 or 30 35 maybe stunt people in those days right and they wanted uh, over 100 people to be ninjas on the attack so they came in from all walks of life as you say from taxi drivers to bouncers on the door to all sorts of thugs the underworld amazing <laughs> amount of characters tom Absolutely. dick and harry all thrown in <laughs> oh yeah but fantastic characters you know and you could buy anything you wanted on the set there were people bringing in you know <laughs> smoked salmon to sherry it was just before christmas so everybody did all their christmas shopping from all these dodgy deals that all these people had got going i, I bought my first car on it with my first stunt adjustment which oh, was well, 90 pounds and I bought a Ford Anglia, like Harry Potter drives. And right. I bought that with 90 pounds. And I said to the guys, yeah, it's got bald tires. Could anybody do tires? I went, oh, yeah, what's the, what's the make and all everything else? I told them. So the next day I drove to the set and somebody turned up with a rented Ford <laughs> Anglia and just swapped the wheels <laughs> over. Swap the wheels off it. Wheel, <laughs> we went, but... and, they had them, and most of the stuntmen, you know, were stuntmen. And yes. they did... What's his name? Bob Simmons. Yeah. Came up with an idea of getting a bit of rubber. You come down, they put ropes on, on the top of the ceiling. You come down the rope on a rubber, you squeezed it, and it stops you. Well, sometimes you didn't stop. Yeah. Sometimes you carried on going. People did, didn't people, they? A few people done their ankles. It wasn't, it wasn't safe, but. You but know, certainly, as far as uh, as far as the numbers were concerned, I mean, there weren't that many st actual stuntmen. No, I think, there, I were think in, in total on that one, if I remember, there must have been about 20, 30 stuntmen right. on on the big big calls, about thirty maximum. Mm. And the you rest know. were made up from, you know, uh, judo clubs or gymnasiums or guys exactly. who were fit. Exactly. That's how I, if I wanted somebody, I'd go down to my judo club and bring them in, like Val Musetti. Yes. He was a stuntman. I brought him in. Terry right. Terry Beard, yeah, brought him in. And, uh, you know, because they could react and they could do falls. Like, that's how I got it. Because I was a black belt, I used to be able to do falls on the deck and, so because, like of, because of your judo experience and your flexibility, were you yeah. involved in, you, I suppose you were involved in a great many of those um, explosions and reactions that were taking place? Oh, I know yeah. Martin yeah, you're right. That's, that's, that's why I was used, because my reflexes were good. 
And not, none of the other stuntmen could do it. No, th this was done, it. They'd never done judo. No, no. Because judo was only just really making a making an just appearance. Just coming in. It? It just came in on the Blackman. It was on the Blackman Diner rig, you know, all that yeah. judo bit in the all that all all new all new stuff. And I was fortunate I got to black belt with it with and, Dougie Robinson and Joe Robinson. That's a, right. Yeah. In a judo in a club called the Judo Choir in London, I spent most of my nights there doing, you know, I got, I got free judo because I got to black belt quite quickly. I was giving lessons yes. to the newcomers and I didn't have to pay a dojo fee, right. you know, because I was giving lessons for them, helping them out. You know, as, as far as the size of the picture was concerned, what was it like from, from your point of view, turning up on, that must have been the biggest set you'd ever been on, surely by that time oh, to, to work on. You can't, Excuse me, just going to get a drink. Yeah. I uh, I can't tell you. It was a, you know, you're right. From doing the Avengers on a little small stage to going into this great big stage, I think it was eight stage. Or, or did they build they, it? They built it, I think, a lot of it they on the back lot there, yeah. 007. It was on 007 stage, yeah. Excuse the me. back of it, yeah. Um, yeah. All of a sudden, I'm now, in, you know, with Sean Connery as 007. And it was just um, mind-boggling. And thank God, my, my, that's where people say you, you, you're you very lucky you had your father in it. That's where my father first introduced me to Pinewood Studios. And Sean, when yeah, Sean, yeah. I, remember seeing, I remember seeing Sean in the makeup room putting his wig on. <laughs> yes, that's right, yeah. Not his own hair in those days. No, um, no. We've all seen the shots in these action films. The guard throws the grenade, there's a massive explosion, and the stuntman flies through the air, blown up by the blast. Well, Bob Simmons and George Leach were again at the forefront of creativity when it came to giving an explosion a great deal more than just a fireball, as we'll see here. Being blown up on film is an art form. To get the maximum effect, the director will often go for the slow motion approach as we see the stuntman fly through the air. Here, from the war film The Wild Geese in 1978, stunts arranged by Bob Simmons, a trampoline explosion with two performers. Bouncing down for the final time, they cue the explosion, then dive through the air, landing in the safety of a padded box rig. All sorts of devices have been used over the years to create this effect on screen. This is from the 1985 Arnold Schwarzenegger blockbuster Commando. Grenade thrown, explosions go off, and the stuntmen are thrown through the air. But look on the ground. They're using air rams, which have been rather clumsily left in the final edit by the editor. But it shows how explosions and reactions have moved on since those early days. Here, from The Spy Who Loved Me, the trampoline explosion filmed from the front and in slow motion catches stuntman Mark Boyle flying towards camera and losing his beret along the way. Also check out the background. As you'll see in the next clip, it looks like all the trampoline explosions were filmed in one area on the 007 stage. Also, it wasn't unusual to catch the last few seconds of an explosion as seen here. Stuntmen Nick Hobbs on the left and Rick Lester on the right again in slow-mo for effect. Meanwhile, back in 1967, the trampoline explosion was still in its infancy, and one good bang was enough to film from a number of different camera angles. This is the same explosion, with stuntmen Cliff Diggins on the right and Martin Grace on the left, covering a fair distance in order to convey the size of the explosion behind them. Another Simmons masterclass. So if you've enjoyed today's show, and let's be honest, why wouldn't you? Then subscribe, the buttons are down here. Click the subscribe button and enter a world of excitement simply at the touch of a button. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.